in favor of the motion, it's time to end affirmative action. Uh, John McWhorter, please go to the podium. I think that when we discuss um, racial preferences, and I am going to largely restrict what I'm saying to racial preferences in universities, although many of these things also apply to affirmative action as handled elsewhere, we often are under the impression that what we're talking about is something as simple as a tie-breaking process, a thumb on the scale, the idea being that if qualifications are equal or more or less equal between a black and a white candidate, that one gives the nod to the black person. I personally would find nothing problematic with that policy. I don't think most people would. And to the extent that it is generally implied, generally via omission, that that's what we're talking about when we talk about racial preferences and that we're not talking about qualifications or test scores or things that we don't want to talk about, then it's understandable that there reigns a sense that to be opposed to these racial preference policies means that a person must be naive or unfeeling or have a sinister agenda or something like that. All of that is, is perfectly, perfectly understandable. And then certain words are used, inequality, resegregation, white privilege, societal racism, etc. And all of those concepts are important. There is a great deal of injustice in the country now, and there always has been, and we should think about it. But those words also have a kind of rhetorical power that I think distracts us from the actual logic of the case here and what racial justice is. That is, how we actually solve the problems that I think we're all concerned with. And from what I've seen over my years in discussing this question, there are certain basic facts about how racial preferences are played out that we're not often told. I don't think that people who think differently than me are willfully ignoring these things. I think these things just don't get out there very much, but they are absolutely crucial to evaluating this particular case. And in my remaining seven minutes and about 13 seconds, I just want to give you a few of those things. For one thing, affirmative action, racial preferences as we're talking about, is not just a tiebreaker. If that's really all this debate had been about, I never would have joined it. There are all sorts of things. In 1991, in terms of all of the students who were admitted to selective law schools, um, there were 420 black ones, 24 were admitted according to what the qualifications were considered to be appropriate for for white and Asian students. All the rest of them, just based on the numbers, wouldn't have gotten in. I respect what Tim Wise has said. We have very different data in terms of the qualifications. If it were true the qualifications were the same, this would be a rather vacuous and petty debate. But the fact is that according to anything that I know, they're not. For example, one argument that we might hear before we leave tonight is that SATs are meaningless. Now, there are dueling studies on that. I'm not sure exactly where one is to stand as a good thinking person at this point. But certainly, it bears mentioning that if you looked at UC Berkeley undergraduates who were black and their graduation rates after 1988, they actually tracked in virtual lockstep with SAT scores. The lower the score, the more likely the person was to graduate. That suggests to me something that I think all of us know deep down, which is that no matter how you jigger the statistics, SAT scores do mean something. Not everything, of course, but they do mean something. Or, for example, Richard Sander has shown that um, with um, black students admitted to 163 law schools, that because so very many of them were admitted not according to the qualifications that they submitted, but out of a sense of a commitment to diversity and lowering standards, that over half of them were in the bottom 10% of their class, and that wasn't only in the first year, and that there was a truly alarming rate of failing the bar exam. Now, these are all difficult issues, but things like this, and needless to say, I could go on for a very long time, but I've only got eight minutes. They have to be brought into a debate like this. They cannot be ignored. They cannot be trivialized. These things are real. Also, to eliminate racial preferences at selective universities does not deny black people an education. 
at UC San Diego before the ban on racial preferences out in California, exactly one out of 3,268 freshmen who were black were making honors. After the ban, 20% of black students were making honors because the students who would have been admitted to Berkeley or UCLA were now admitted to UC San Diego. I think that was a good thing. It certainly wasn't a bad thing, and it's something that needs to be talked about. Let's talk a little bit about diversity because I think that's going to come up. For one thing, I remember being in college, and this is purely anecdotal, but the idea of someone calling on me in class to talk about you know, my take on the black experience or what the black perspective on things was, was something that made me sweat bullets, and I've heard this from countless black undergraduates, many of whom tell me when I'm doing a book tour that to them, that's evidence that there's racism at universities, that they're expected to be diverse representatives. So we can talk about diversity, but how does it actually feel to be a diverse person? More to the point, it's often said that diversity has been proven to make for a better quality education. Has it? How? Like, if you've ever actually looked into that, the people who try to prove it with studies, and none of them are conservatives, find again and again that, as I think we all knew, diversity does not really have anything to do with giving you a more beneficial experience in terms of how much knowledge you have in your head or how much moral wisdom you have in your head after you come from college. There was a poll of University of Michigan minority um, law school grads from 1970 to 1996. For them, being called on as a diverse person in class was at the very bottom of what they valued most about their experience, as was the diversity. What they most valued in their experience was how smart teachers and their fellow students were. Remember, this is minority students. Or J. Mitchell Chang showed that in terms of diversity in your undergraduate experience, it did mean that you talked about race more on campus, but it didn't mean that you had more friends of another race, and it didn't improve your GPA, and it didn't improve how you felt about going to college. Stephen Cole and Eleanor Barber have shown that when black students are placed in schools where they actually would have been more appropriately placed in terms of qualifications, and qualifications do matter, into schools like these, then what happened is that they made lower grades which discouraged them from going to get PhDs. This was a study done by good liberal people. They did not expect it. But that means that we have fewer black academics because of these policies. Now, based on the things that I've mentioned, one. clearly they belong at the table. I do want to say one thing. The idea that all of these sorts of things that I've discussed and the fact that there are other ways of addressing this problem are there, and they're worth talking about. The notion that anybody would say that a legacy student is something that black students should be proud to compare themselves to, or that a legacy student is something that is okay, I, I, I don't get it, I met legacy students when I was in school, it was not a pretty picture. I certainly do not agree with these legacy policies. However, because I'm black, I'm talking about this kind of policy as it is applied to people of my race because I think that it hurts them. I'm not going to make some hoary argument about the Constitution or something like that. I don't think that it helps black students to be the best that they can be. And I think I'll stop there, but there are issues in this debate that we simply don't hear about. It's not as simple as just being against resegregation John and McCoy, calling for diversity. You Thank can you. Stop right there, in fact. Thank you.